Hello, and welcome to the Consistent Profits Podcast, brought to you by Inside Out Trading and Brian McAvoy, where the focus is on consistency, because when you have the consistent part down, profits become easy. Well, hello, everyone, and this is Brian McAvoy with a new episode of the Consistent Profits Podcast. I'm excited today to be interviewing Brent Penford, creator of IndexTrader.com.au. Brent, thanks for so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Hey, glad you're here, man. Now, for everybody who's not familiar with Brent, uh, Brent's been trading for nearly 40 years. Uh, he's got experience trading his own accounts, plus he's traded for other firms. So he's got some unique perspectives on, on you know, on, on the markets and trading in general. Uh, he's written two books, uh, The Universal Principles of Successful Trading and Universal Tactics of Successful Trend Trading. And he also provides a daily study guide, three different level courses on trading. And since 2004, he's been publishing the newsletter Index Alert to which he offers a 21-day free trial. Uh, Brent's a firm believer in transparency, and he's also a very down-to-earth guy. I love my Aussie buddies. And again, thanks for being here and being game for the interview, man. Oh, thank you very much for reaching out. And, um, you know, it's, um, I'm looking forward to talking with you. Yeah. Um, now, I, I always have to ask everybody, just because trading is kind of an outlier occupation, not, not many people choose to be traders. Um, you know, what led you to choose trading, you know, back in the 80s? How do you wind up like, you know, joining Bank of America as a trainee dealer uh, back in 83? Oh, it, it was a combination, a hybrid of um, um, uh, purpose and then fluke or random. Essentially, I was at, at university uh, studying a, a Bachelor of Commerce degree uh -huh. and um, and I, I was in, in, enrolled to do my my honours. My fourth my fourth year was going to be an honours year. Oh, nice. And um I spoke to some people just about my future and my dad asked me to um, talk to his accountant because dad had been retired for 30 or 40 years. So he thought his accountant could give me some advice and he, he gave me really good advice. And he said, you can always, you know, employ people to manage factories. But in his opinion, the most important thing is to understand how money moves. So mm -hmm. his recommendation to me in 1983 was get some work experience with a merchant bank. So I essentially sent off about 20 resumes to merchant banks in Sydney to do a, a summer, you know, work experience. Uh -huh. And, you know, and that was fantastic. And, and Bank America basically gave me this offer to say that um, we will give you three months on the condition that if, if we like you um, and you successfully, you know, graduate with your, 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 your honours degree, mm -hmm. we have first option on your employment. Wow. So... I said, fine, no, no problems. And that happened at a time in Australia when we were actually under a fixed currency regime, fixed currency regime. So our Australian dollar wasn't floating. Okay. This is the backdrop. I'm, I'm 21. Um, and also the, the, the backdrop in Australia, they were talking about introducing foreign banks. Huh. So it was just an alignment of all these wonderful opportunities and the bank just said, look, we'll put you three months in the money market, three months in, oh, sorry, a month in money market, a month in banking, and a month in, I know, um, structured leasing. So I started off in the in the money market. And essentially, uh, that was, I loved that. And, and then, I mean, I was on the money market desk when everyone was, everybody was speculating about how the Australian dollar would be floated. Yeah. And so... As a 21-year-old, you know, I'm, you know, I'm helping the the, the, the promise note uh, trader, which is just short-dated uh, notes, um, quality a little bit less than bank bills. And we made a million dollars over over a week because people were just buying Aussie dollars to speculate that it's going to be revalued. It had to be parked in you know short-term paper. Oh. Like, can you imagine if you're 21 when a million dollars was a million dollars? And it was just, it was, you know, it was just mind blowing. I was so excited. And then after that one month, they sent me to banking and they, um, we had quite a, a very high profile um, entrepreneur called Alan Bond, who, um, you know, eventually paid a billion dollars to pay, to buy one of our leading um, TV channels. And at that time, I think he was trying to buy, you know, um, uh, pub, uh, or pub, um, alcohol, you know, beer, beer companies. And he came to Bank of America wanting for a loan. And I said, Brent, here's, here's all that stuff on you know, Alan Bond. Give us your opinion. And, and, and I had three volumes of Lee Rats Bonders in the boardroom. And they shut the door on me. And um, I think I fell asleep. 
I dead set. I just just glazed. And any, anyway, long story short, um, because Bank of America wanted to apply for a foreign banking license, they decided to um, uh, redevelop the trading room, and they opened a brand new trading room. This was this was when I, up, up, you know my fifth or sixth week at Bank of America, and they had, um, opened a brand new banking room with with the confidence that they would be awarded a foreign banking license, which obviously they did get one eventually. Right. And they had all these pods. They said, Brent, we loved you. You, you engaged, you, you interacted with, with everybody. We'd love you to um, join us full time. And of course, you know, it wasn't my intention, but after that one week, particularly um, where we made all that money, yeah, I was sold. So, that, so yes, it was deliberate because I wanted to get experience about my future. The our family accountant said, "Work for a bank, understand how money flows." Bank of America was generous to, um, you know, employ me on the condition that I would, you know, join them if they were happy with me. And I did my honors. And anyway, what happened was, um, I joined Bank of America um, on this uh, securities desk. So, so in the domestic money market, and they put me onto the securities desk, and. And a long story short, what ended up was I was there for three three years, and I ended up um, I, I didn't finish my honours, but I convinced our chief accountant for uh, money markets and our treasurer, who was an American, lovely guy Peter Nielsen. He's now in charge of a, a large bank in uh, in London as the CEO. Um, I convinced both of them to do their master's degree. So we all went off to the university to complete our master's degree because I always felt I hadn't. The cream, the cream on my my degree, and so we all went off uh, and did our master's degree, and uh, I, I had a fantastic time. Yeah. Oh, wow. wow, cool. That's that's a cool story, man. How you wound up? That, how neat. Um. Now, so you, but so you did complete your master's degree or your, your master's yeah. commerce degree. Mm. Okay. So how long did you stay with Bank America? I, I left just before, just after the crash, just after the crash. And um, uh, my last, oh, you know, share market crashed in 87. So okay. I was there. So 83, four years, four years, okay. four years. Because I was there and I, and um, uh, talking about being imprinted as, as a duckling, um, I was first introduced to Elliott Wave at Bank of America and um, oh, News Corp, Buddy Murdoch, right? News Succession, new, they're always in the paper. Um so I remember my, my dad ringing me up and asking me if I was okay after the crash because he just thought, you know, I'm a, I'm a speculator and was I okay? And and actually, we made I made money. I bought a bought a put a put option on News Corp, and um and it's very vo volatile. And uh, actually, you know, I made about twelve thousand dollars, which is just a, just just you know based on the back of Elliott Wave, and that was fantastic. So I, I left just after that, and essentially, um. At the time, Bank America had what was regarded as one of the best corporate um, uh, asset liability foreign exchange management systems. So, if you were a, a, this national business and, and you had had um, obviously you know assets and liabilities in your domestic currency, but you also had assets and liabilities in, in foreign currencies, mm -hmm. you know you had to manage your FX risk. And mm -hmm. I I finished up on the FX desk. So so during my journey at Bank America. I won an internal competition at Bank America. Uh, Bank America used to run these competitions, uh, not competitions, um, training courses, in-house training courses for, for corporates and their own staff. It was fantastic. We'd go to a hotel and um, they'd, they'd buddy up everybody. In the, it could be 20, 20 students. It was, it was a worldwide program. The, um, it was run by you know, head office in America. So all the stuff that came to Sydney, were, they're all Americans. And they go, went, went all around you know, North America, South America, Europe. And they'd run this course, and basically they go to a hotel, buddy everybody up, all connected, and and the head guys would basically be the central bank, and they would make announcements, and that would simulate FX, yeah. and 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 I did uh, I think it was three days, and two days was all education, and the third day was going live, and I and, and I won that, and um. And so they gave me, they put me onto the, um, uh, the forex desk and put me in charge of swaps because swaps is just a different differentiation between you know uh, yield curves, which I knew all about. Right. Anyway, um, <laughs> and that's how I got I got familiar with this corporate software package because suddenly I was on the FX desk and we have corp 
you know, corporate clients that have, have an FX exposure. Mm-hmm. And it was a really good uh, bookkeeping system. But one thing it didn't have was a decision matrix for the corporate, for the corporate to say, if you've got a liability or an asset, rather get, regardless of whether it's domestic currency or foreign currency, where's the best place to put your surplus cash? And where's your best place to borrow, regardless of whether it's um, um, a, 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 a domestic liability or a foreign li- liability? Because through the FX, you can borrow money from wherever you want. And essentially, I developed in conjunction with a, um, a senior person at the bank who was a, a programmer, and we all did it you know, on the weekends. I d- developed an arbitrage program oh. and as a, as a pricing tool for um for corporates to say you know if you if you have regardless of whether you have if surplus assets or surplus liabilities mm-hmm. is this you got to understand what the yield curves are doing domestically and internationally and you can bring it back to one decision matrix you know which way should you jump and right. so i left bank america to basically um sell my arbitrage program and i sold those to merchant banks in australia and new zealand and some corporates yeah wow very cool, man. Well, especially considering the uh, the technology of the day. Um, oh, it's, it's I, mean, cool. I was walking around. I probably had, you know, remember, remember compact compact computers? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My 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 <laughs> first compact computer was basically like a big fat lunch uh, yeah lunch box. You know, you know, big chunky ones. You know, big oh, chunky yeah. ones like the big square ones. Yeah. You know, you you, you, <laughs> you carry around on your hip, but it was like a big box. <laughs> yeah, 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 oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's oh, what right. I had. It cost I think it cost about ten thousand dollars back then, and <laughs> um, and and I was doing it all in. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember. Like today we have Excel, but back then you probably remember there was Symf- Sym- Symphony, Symphony, Symph- Yeah, Symphony was is like what Excel is, and it had um a web uh, had had spreadsheet, it had word processing, and it had a, a database. It was actually more advanced than Excel. It actually had more, and it had um, a macro script in it. So, we, so my friend wrote the arbitrage program in Symphony. So, you know, it worked. All right. Huh. Well, so at what point? So, you, so you left you left Bank of America to to go sell this, um, but you started trading on your own, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So at the bank, the bank had a very strict policy. You cannot obviously trade. You trade in the markets where you you run a book, right? And I, en- I ended up uh, before I moved to FX, I was in charge of um, bank bills. I was a manager of short term securities, which basically meant you know we did everything, we hedged everything in the future. So I was basically in charge of I, I trade bank bills, but I I you know do most of my stuff in the bank bill futures right. for ninety days. So we're a bank. Um, so banks basically deal in, in deposits and currencies, not equities. So it was okay for us to trade, you know, um, sh- we didn't trade shares. Uh, we were trading the what, what's called the Australian equivalent of the S&P 500, and that's called the Share Price Index in Australia. It's called the SPY, SPY Futures Contract. Right. So we traded this, the SPY Futures Contract on our on our personal account. And I can tell you the first trade I put on was on my bank card. Now, the bank card in Australia is like your MasterCard or your right. Visa card. So, right. you know, talk about the the, 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 the the confidence or the enthusiasm of youth. I, I put that trade. I told my, I, I went through my broker and I said, Angie, and Angie's still there, would you believe? She's still um, a, a broker. I said, Angie, uh, I want to do this for my personal account, I'm not trading bank bills. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I want to put a, a trade on the um, index, a SPY. And she goes, okay, Brent, that's, that's fine. And uh, yeah, and she said, well, I need a deposit, a margin. I said, well, do you take a credit card? She said, yeah, yeah. So did it on bank card. Yeah. So so how did that go? Made money. You know what's terrible is that we basically. So my my, my early influence was Elliott Wave and Fibonacci, right? Okay. So I was a discretionary trader. And the worst thing you can do is make money following that. And we'd be all there, and and like. I had some, you know, I was a baby. I was on the baby on the desk, and my um, there was two bosses, one uh, or two senior guys. One was my boss. The two senior guys was one was in charge of bonds, and the other guy was in charge of all of us, right? And the guy was charge, charge in charge of bonds. He he was ex treasury from Canberra, a senior economist. And my boss, 
and we're all seeing the same stuff and we'd be there watching you know the, the spy had sort of rallied and it come down and we said oh you know it's going to come down to 0.618 and we'd watch the spy tick by tick come come down to that magic number and we'd just buy it right we wouldn't wait for any confirmation we just buy the dip and the thing would stop and buddy reverse you know and we just think we were geniuses and we discovered all the answers to the universe and you know um all the things that i've now i now know um aren't true but that's that's how i started and um it took me a long time um to shake off elliot wave and i will say today i still can't help counting waves i still can't help it i'm a mechanical trader today um i have got some some elements of elliot wave into some of my mechanical models right um yeah, but it's 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 hard. Like when you're you're so young and you 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 know that's what your first introduction and you had successes. This is before I blew up two accounts and almost blew up a third account. Um, but that early success sort of reinforces, I suppose, you know, bad habits. Oh sure. Well, yeah. yeah. The the early days uh, as a trader for for everybody. Um, I, I and I try to get this across to people is most of the problems that you're facing today or, or, or at least some it's come from your early days as a trader, just because those are formative months and so many perspectives and attitudes and responses get, you know, wired into you in those early months and you know, maybe even a couple of years and it can be really hard to shake them. And, and so, yeah, you got to, got to rewire that stuff if you're, you know, if you're struggling. So uh, very cool. Now um, over the years, you've been exposed to a lot of information on trading. Uh, you know, you got to, you know, different books, I'm sure, seminars, software, uh, probably seen a lot of different uh, strategies and methodologies. Uh, what are some of the lessons and insights that you've gained along the way? Sure, sure. My number one thing, I mean, one of my books I sort of asked um, in my universal universal principles of successful trading, I did a bit of a market wizards thing at the, um, the second half of the book where I basically reached out to a lot of traders. I, I, I got gotten to know, know, to know over my, my years Mm -hmm. And I asked them for, you know, what's your one piece of advice? If, if all you could do was just, you know, like you've been, they've been trading for 20, 30 years, you can only give one piece of advice, you know, what would that be? And um, if somebody asked me that question, my, my question is simply, please understand the importance and ensure that you embrace, and if you forget, tattoo it on the back of your eyelids, the importance of risk of ruin. Understand what your risk of ruin is. So, we all know instinctively when we engage with the market, there's a risk. We know, we know that. We're not stupid. We're not stupid. We know there's a risk. And we do know that we should only trade with what we can afford to lose. So we, we sort of intuitively know that. Um, but there's a concept called risk of ruin, which is a mathematical concept. And in my opinion, um, there's only there's two key factors about why you, know, you and I and others are successful in trading, in my opinion. And number one, it's the math. And number two, we're both really good losers. We don't mind losing, happy to lose. We take all our losses, right? The math. The math, the key component of the math is that you need to trade with a 0% risk of ruin. So when we engage with the markets, of course, there's a risk. We know that. I can afford to lose $500. I can afford that. That's good. But did you know there's a mathematical um, uh, uh, measure on what you're about to do? right? What you're about to do, there is a mathematical measure on what you're about to do with that $500. And in my opinion, if that mathematical measure is not at 0%, you're just wasting that money. You're throwing it away because any risk of ruin over a, over a 0% is a guarantee that you'll go bust. Somebody with a mathematical risk of ruin will say 30% will go, go broke quicker than somebody who has, say, a 1% risk of ruin mm -hmm. okay because obviously 30 percent is higher than one percent the person with even one percent risk of ruin they will go broke it's just a matter of time and risk of ruin is a really simple idea it's a simple idea and essentially it's a combination of the two main things that we do as traders how we engage in the market we have a particular way that we approach the market which is our edge our methodology and that edge that methodology has what what we call a mathematical expectancy we have, you know, what's our edge? What's our expectancy? That's mathematical. Second thing we do is our position sizing. How much are we prepared to risk? Is it $500, $100, $5,000? So we have a, a money management approach, which 
dictates our position sizing. When you combine your position sizing or money management with your positive expectancy, it comes together that gives you a mathematical risk of ruin. It's it's a number. It's 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 science. Yeah. And most people are unaware of what their risk of ruin is. Now, if they go back and look at their their their, their ledger entries or their trades, they they can um, retrospectively they can retros- retrospectively calculate what the risk of ruin is because you will have you know um, what what's your percentage of wins and losses? What's your average loss? What's your average win? Mm-hmm. They're all the key components for expectancy. Right. And then when you look at all those position sizing, compare them to your 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 capital base, and that will give you tell you how many units of money have you been trading with. If I risk a hundred dollars, how many? What does that represent in terms of units of money that I have? Like you know, what what's the units of money? If I if I risk five hundred dollars per trade, then I'll obviously have a less uh, number of units of money as opposed to if I risk only a hundred dollars per trade. When you combine your money management, which basically tells you how many units of money you have, compared, compare, um, combined with how you trade, your expectancy, that gives you a mathematical risk of ruin. And in my book, I say, you know, we're not stupid. We're not stupid. And if, if you're in a position where you can afford to lose your risk capital, you're not stupid because along the way you've accumulated risk capital. But most people are a bit ignorant, right? They don't understand what they're engaging with is, you know, if your risk of ruin is 20%, 15%, don't, stop trading. You, you you may have a bit of fun for six months or, or, or a year, but eventually you'll go broke. It's just mathematically, you know, determined. So my big thing is understand and embrace what is this risk of ruin and unpack it, unpack it. Um, now, I, I trade with a fixed percentage risk of ruin, and I try to risk less than half a percent of my capital. Uh, I, I trade really small compared to my risk capital. And I do that for two reasons. One reason is I trade over 30 markets, and I can have five or six signals triggered you know, during a session, right? So suddenly I'm not risking half a percent. I'm risking two, two and a half percent, right? Yeah. But, but more importantly... Uh, risking half a percent of my risk capital, that gives me 200 units of money. I've always got 200 units of money. So even if, like right now, I, I'm in drawdown. I was in draw. I was in drawdown in 2001. I came out of drawdown last year. I was so happy. I'm back in drawdown, right? I have an expectation I'll come out, but it's just the life of the trader. Now, I have, my expectation is that my model's, you know, are just going through a dip and, and my, my expectancy is robust. But even if my expectancy or my systems continue to operate poorly for the next six six months or 12 months, I always have 200 units of money because my fixed percentage is it's a half a percent of my current account base. So as my account loses money, loses money, I'm still risking only half a percent, but my dollar amount is less. So I'm never going to go broke. Right, I can be frustrated. I can be just sad. I can just scratch my head, but I know I'm trading with a zero percent risk of ruin, and that, and that gives me confidence. So yeah, so my number one thing would be for for people just to you know dust off a few books and just read up about risk of ruin and understand that anyone who engages actively like we do in the markets, we all have a risk of ruin, and it's just a function of what's your edge, what's your edge, i.e., how often do you win, how often do you lose. What's your average loss? What's your av- av- average win? You put that into a simple formula that gives you your expectancy. Then and then look at your how you position size. You know what's your money management technique? How many units of money does that give you? You, you bring it together. Now, if your average win and average loss is equal one to one, there's a very simple formula to calculate your risk of ruin, and it's it's in my book. You, you can find it anywhere. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, for most of us, our, our average win is not equal to our average loss. It's not. For those who are really short-term traders, they may find their average win is less than the average loss. For those who trade with the trend, they usually find their average win is a lot bigger than the average loss. Unfortunately, there's no simple 
formula that you can put the values in. So you have to run a simulation with a, 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 a you know, with a random number generator, and you, you run it thirty times, and you got to put into your, your your simulator. You know how do you train in terms of expectancy? How do you train in terms of position sizing? So you you input how many units of money you trade with. You put in your edge, and you 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 just run the thing thirty times, so it's statistically significant, and it's just random to see how many times the equity curve stays positive or goes goes negative, and that's how how that's how I calculate the risk of ruin because I I traded with a a forty, I trade a portfolio of strategies, and in my basket they give me a forty percent expectancy, and I've got two hundred units of money, and I I just know I'm trading with a zero percent risk of ruin. Nice, huh? Now, as far as what you trade, you, you focus on futures and indices, correct? Mm. Okay. How, how do you wind up settling on those, having all the choices that you do? Oh, God. If I could turn back the clock, I could, would do it completely different. Dead set, I'll do it completely different. But like everyone, we just start off, you know, one step at a time. Mm. I, I end up at Bank America and, and really, really random. It's just dad said, talk to the accountant. The accountant said, find out how money operates. The accountant said, get you know job experience work experience with a merchant bank and i just I, I got very lucky that in australia things were happening and bank america was here so i got very lucky can't trade anything that i trade for the bank so we all basically all of us we all punted the local index right we all punted the s&p or what we call the spy right. and it started off with one market you know that's all you can afford to trade so i just said i just traded one um one um contract one market with one account and um essentially um i blew up two accounts and i almost blew up a third account and this is during my whole experience with the idiot wave mm -hmm. and and the progression was essentially um i had to be more uh, mechanical i had to find something um essentially that had a higher probability and something where i could actually measure measure the evidence that if I wanted to go, go down that path, there was a probability that I'll have a, a positive edge. Sure. And um, essentially, so I went from a single index contract. And what, what happened was um, uh, in Australia, the biggest trader education business was a business that was promoting GAN, WD GAN. Okay. Sure. And they had a notorious reputation with experienced traders um, because all the experienced traders who persisted had worked out it was a scam, right? It's a dead set scam, you know. And I shouldn't use those hard words because I'm 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 a, I'm a true believer in saying you should listen to everyone, listen to everyone, because you're not sure what ideas will, will resonate, and whatever those whichever ideas hit a snap here and go, oh, that's interesting, that's good, but follow a good process to validate it. Follow a good process to validate it. So I probably shouldn't say it's a scam if it takes takes your fancy. Okay. That's fine. Go down that path, but be 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 objective, you know. Be be um, you know process driven and look for evidence, right? So any, anyway, this guy was the general manager of this educational uh, business in Australia. They, they, they by far it, it, it educated the most number of traders in Australia, and the courses went from yeah you know, introductory, intermediate to advanced to super advanced. And the super advanced, they were selling that course for twenty thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah, selling the dream, selling the secret of Gan, right? So he appeared on a forum one day, and 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 because he, he left he left the business, so the general manager appeared on the forum, and you know there was six of us, and I think it was about two thousand members, and back then two thousand members was a lot of lot of members on this forum, and there was about six of us that were posting live trades, and I was one of them, and so he comes in and he says, oh, this is something that's quite interesting, and it was like a a, a chart from 1940 based on corn and and, and so that just um it's like a just it's like a red rag to a bull and so i jumped on there and said that's got that's just not relevant to what we're doing here there's only six of us who are here and 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 the whole you can see the whole philosophy of what we're doing is live stuff you know it's not historical you know and it's mainly indices or local shares not corn and i just think I said, I accused, I accused him of trawling for customers, right? And I said, the way that you guys should buddy educate people is that you should demonstrate to people that you trade what you teach. You should trade what you teach. You know, and I said, you know what? I want to go off. I want to get myself licensed by our Australian uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. You know, our, 
it's called the Australian, it's ASEC, like your SEC or in America. I said, I'm going to go off and get licensed and I'm going to make available a simple mechanical system. I'll, I'll, it's available for sale. I'm going to trade it and I'm going to put my real-time results you know, on, on the website so people can see it. So it's all about transparency. And I said, by the way, I'm not going to reply to any email that you send me because I know you are a wordsmith. You are a wordsmith and I won't be able to compete with you. You'll, you'll make me look silly with your clever talk. But I'll tell you, it, I think you're trolling for clients. You're, you're selling the dream and the hope. Well, we're, what we're here is we're showing live trades. We're showing you the losses and the profits and keeping it practical. And really, I think teachers should be de um, demonstrating to people that you that you trade what you teach. So that's how I got, that, that's how I got into um, this educational business. Huh. So I so like up my website um, it was all by accident. It was just basically yeah. you know uh, you know up up a big up yours to this expert, this educator expert. Yeah. To demonstrate this is how it should be done. Yeah, yeah. So, huh. well, yeah. so how do you how do you wind up uh, deciding to write a book? Oh, oh, so sorry. Yeah, so, um, so I started off with one market, the Australian index market. So yeah. this model that I developed, right? Everybody was asking me. Yeah, sorry, I forgot what, where I was going. Everybody was asking me, Brent. I love that you trade this the Australian index market, but does it work on other markets? I said, look, I don't know. I just trade. I just trade. The Australian index market. I don't know if it works on the FTSE or the S and P or the Nikkei or the Hang Seng. Right. Anyway, after six months, of people saying, "Oh, Brent, do these patterns work on these other markets?" And I kept saying, "Sorry, no. I just trade the local market." It made me curious. And I think I had eight patterns for my um, local index market, and I ran them over the global portfolio of indices, mm -hmm. and it made money, which surprised me. Right. And then half the patterns were really good. And the other half, half of patterns were rubbish. And so that, that got me thinking, I'd probably prefer to trade those patterns which are more versatile because they're, they're obviously more robust. Yeah. And so I, I um, pushed aside half the patterns and, and kept the four. And I, I, I increased my portfolio from one market to six markets. So I started, I started trading the, the Nikkei, the Hang Seng, the Taiwan, the, the FTSE, the DAX, and the S&P. The, um, so that's how I went from one market to a, a portfolio of indices. And then the next step after that was to, because now I trade a you know, global portfolio of all markets in the indices. You now, do you remember in the early 2000s, volatility was going down, like really diminished, volatility really diminished. And for index trading, um, my stuff really needed the markets to be volatile. So I had to diverse. And so that moved me into tr trend trading and trading global markets. So nice. That's that's my pathway. Very cool. So so you wind up kind of putting the, putting your site together by accident, but now you've also developed courses uh, over time. Mm -hmm. So what what are your courses about? Because you, you have like beginner, intermediate, and advanced courses. Yeah, yeah. So but basically, um, tell us about your courses. Yeah, the courses they they didn't happen overnight. They, they, they took twenty years to develop because mm -hmm. my educational thing. I love it because it gives me an opportunity to talk to people like like yourself and have some engagements. Because as a trader, I'm essentially a hobbit. You know, I don't talk to anyone. You know, Cartier. You know, my boys don't really know what I do. You know, they just see me, just think I'm an investor. You know, and I'm happy for that, right? So, having an ed educational business, um, you know, it gives you a bit of um, contact. Uh, so, everything's happened by accident. Um, I just thought I do, I do a lot of workshops, right? I, I try and do a workshop every year. And then I was invited to um, uh, present in China, um, one of their largest futures brokers. And they invited me to the Peking University to present um, uh, to their economics department. And that was an amazing experience. And, um, and you know, I've, I've always, I always want to, you know, do my best. And I, I did that, and that's amazing. In China, I've been there quite a few times now, but in Peking, like, they put me up in this hotel, five-star hotel, that happened to be, like, 30 yards from the Peking University. And I said to my host, this is amazing. Like, how good is this, that this, you know, there's a five-star hotel so close to the Peking University in Beijing? And, I, and, and uh, how convenient is that? And I said, oh, Brent, Brent. 
the hotel, it's owned by the university. <laughs> it's crazy over there. And then, um, yeah, I, I presented and it was fantastic. And um, yeah, this this auditorium was unbelievable. It was circular. The um, the stage, can you imagine an enormous stage with just curvature, curvature like LCD, yeah, big LCD screens. I don't know, 30 or 40 yards stretching from one corner. To, it was a circular room. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Anyway, I thought that's an outstanding course. And and um, and um so I just thought, you know what, I'm going to make that. A, for those who can't attend my annual workshop, mm -hmm. they, they just want to basically just jump in and just do a video course thing. I just thought, yeah, I'll do it. And I'll do it piecemeal, step by step. And so the first introductory course is only 150 Fifty dollars is cheap as chips, but it gives people a taste of who I am. Mm -hmm. So rather than saying, "Hey, you know, I think what I offer is valuable and do a, do a big dive in for you know thousands of dollars," I make it just incremental. So it's just you know the introductory course is a foundation, mm -hmm. um, foundation principles. I talk a lot about risk of ruin and money management and psychology, and then we build on that and we talk about. Well, we have to be a cynic in this market of trading, in this global thing. Like welcome, welcome all ideas, but you have to independently validate the idea before you actually put money behind it. And so I talk about a lot of that in the introductory course about how do we validate these ideas. And I and I I talk about a library of books and go, you know, look at look at those short look at library, look at me shelves of trading books there are. And I pick one particular category of the market and say, my God, look how many books. Talk about that particular part of the market. Like, wow, that 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 particular mark part of the market's got like three shelves on that wall of books. Isn't that amazing? That must be so good. And so I use that as an example to say, okay, well, you know, everyone's familiar with this, and 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 these books talk about all the same stuff, and and look at all of these, and then I just basically, you know, I do the analysis and say, well, my God, and I run the ideas over a simple portfolio of eight markets covering eight sectors. So it's just small, but I've got a soft, I've got a grain, I've got a metal, I've got a meat, I've got a currency, you know, a diversified portfolio, and, and the, exp the expectancy is negative. And I go, wow, you know, despite how many books, and they're still being published today, right? Still new books. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> crazy, isn't it? But that's okay. That's okay. At least you know one path where it ends in, ends in a cul-de-sac. That's worth that's worth knowing, right? It's worth knowing. So that's 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 the introductory course to say um, get the foundations in, work on more ideas, but independently, you know, validate the ideas. Because be a cynic, you know, listen listen to everyone, but you reserve the right to say whether it's got value in your hands. Look for evidence, and if there's no evidence, then then um, disappointing. But a positive thing is, at least you know that's not a path to go down. And then I share some some tools, which I think I call them universal tools. That they they've got an edge on all markets. So I, I teach teach a number of tools, and then I say, hey, let's put some of these, let's measure these tools, because in the course I measured these ideas, mm -hmm. and these ideas had a negative expectancy. Hey, I'm teaching you about these tools. Shouldn't we measure these tools? And so I put these tools into simple systems and say, there you go. There's an edge. Really simple ideas, primarily based on price. And, and that's the introductory course. And the intermediate course just builds on that. The advanced course builds on that. And so it's just, just incremental. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very cool indeed. So if somebody wants to find out more, then... Uh... They should go to your website. That's the best place to catch up with the index. index oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. Indextrader.com.au. And, and before I even consider my introductory course, just buy one of the books, you know, for $20 or $30. It's just a cheap way of, you know, understanding, you know, how I approach the market and and and, and how I do it may not resonate with everyone. Right. You know, it's just, a, it's a cheap way to get an insight into somebody who's prepared to share what they do. And, and another thing I do, which is which is a little bit unusual, is that um, when I do run my workshops, is that, um, and all I'm doing is just sharing what I do, so it's no big deal. Is I I I, I provide ninety days of live trading, so we have the weekend and we we teach the methodologies, entry, exits, all of that, mm -hmm. and then I give them a period of time so they've got time to code it up to verify, you know, my ideas, mm -hmm. and then. We have live trading for 90 days where they basically watch me trade what I teach mm -hmm. 
90 days. Some people will do a weekend, and a weekend's usually just one evening session on a Sunday, right? Like, you know, when the market's open in the US. So it's not really a whole weekend. It's like one session. I do 90 days. Yeah. And I don't know of any, I don't know anyone who will allow um, their students to watch them, you know, trade what they teach. Yeah. yeah. What's more? And, and that's, the whole idea is it's about habits, isn't it? It's about, you know, um, developing new habits. And, and, and that can be what happens is they start off excited, but by the end of the three months, they're exhausted because they suddenly realize it's work, you know. <laughs> It's repetitive, it's repetitive, you know, download your data, run your setups, watch your open positions, adjust stops, add new orders, all of that. It's just, it's a, it's a job. Yeah, true, true. Oh, well, very cool. Very cool. And, and I like the way you do that where, yeah, you've got a progression to what you're, what you're offering there. That's, that's excellent. So very, um, well, now, one, one thing I got to ask, um, just because this is the Consistent Profits podcast. So what, what do you see as, as one of the primary obstacles or mistakes traders make to keep them from realizing consistent profits? Most people cannot handle losses. Now, we, I, you know, you, 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 you teach good ideas and I, I think I teach good ideas, right? Mm-hmm. They can come to you or they can come to I and, and we'll help them, right? And lo- love to help them. But they don't need to go to you or I to get ideas on how to make money. And in my universal tactics of trend trading, I discuss or share a lot of old ideas. They're not unique to me and and, and it wouldn't be unique to you. These are old ideas that are like 50 years old, right? They make money. Mm -hmm. Like a really simple idea. If you want to be a trend trader, which statistically, you know, the science says it works, um, Cole, Coles and Jones in 1933 um, published a, a research paper and they looked at relative trend trading. And they had a simple simple model just based on the end of month, the close, momentum. If today's month or if, if today's end of month closes higher than the previous month's close, go long and you stay long. And then as you come to each month, just, just compare – the closing month's price to the prior month's price. And if it's gone down, if it's, if, if it's below, then you stop and reverse. So you, you, you stop yourself out or you take your profits on your long and you go short. So you're always in the market. And that idea is, it's like, it's 90 years old. 90 is like, like today's 20, 2023. They published that paper in 1933. It makes money now, but why don't people follow it? And it's because it has bumps in the equity curve, you know, um, you know the, the losses, you know, the the, the um, hypothetical, you know, stops because you, you can't really measure the stops because you don't know, you know, where the months are going to end up, right? But um, what holds people back is losses. People cannot ha- hold can handle losses. It's it's what stops people. You know, it's just losses. It, it's it's like. That's why I think, that's why I say that the most two important um, factors in successful trading, as I mentioned before, in my opinion, the two most important factors behind my success, and I suspect it's behind your success, is number one, the math, which is trade with a 0% risk of ruin. Mathematics does not lie. Right. Does not lie. Number two, you have to be the best loser, right? The best loser is a long-term winner. That's equally as important as trading with a 0% risk of ruin. So you've got all your techniques and your methodology and your money management, super, super important, right? Right? You want to trade with a 0% risk of ruin. But equally important is you have to be a champion loser. And I'll tell you, I am a gold medalist at losing. I'm losing all the time, right? So I take my losses quickly. And I'm, I'm, I'm a trend trader. I'm also a counter trend trader. But generally, I, I lose probably 55% of my trades, mm-hmm. right? So I, ha- I have to be good at losing. If people can embrace the idea of losses, I think they will become more successful. Because when we come to trading, most people are emotionally disorientated. Okay. I came to trading probably for the same reason as you, is that is to make money. Well, we don't trade to lose money, right? Yeah. Right. We trade to make money. We trade to win. So our focus is on accuracy. You know, I want to trade a hundred percent system or a 90% system. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll even be happy to trade an 80% accurate, accurate you know, uh, system, right? Yeah. 
you know, I prefer 90%, prefer 100%, but you know, I can live with 80%, right? And so, and and so we want to, we want to win, we want to win. And what we realize with age and wisdom is accuracy is only one half the equation, right? The most important thing is expectancy, where, where, where accuracy is a component of that, but it's only a component. Right. And so we come into this, 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 this world being uh, emotionally disorientated. We come in wanting to win, to win, to win, to win. Where really what we should be doing is we should have an objective to manage our risk capital with a modest expectation. You know, manage our risk capital with a modest expectation and understand that the inventory that you have to carry in this business of trading are the losses. It's inventory. We have to, you know, we've got to embrace it. So I think um, get people to understand risk of ruin, right? That's just, that's front of shop. Front of shop is, in my opinion, understand risk of ruin because that's going to make sure you trade with a positive edge, that your methodology has a has an edge. Whatever, whichever way you want to trade, it has to have an edge, right? Um, and then when you sort your money management out or your position sizing, that will give you a certain number of units of money. You combine that with your edge, that gives you a risk of ruin and hopefully it's 0%. If it's not 0%, please don't trade. Just, just think about what you're doing and, and work. That's your front of office. Your back of office is you've got to finance this business of trading. Mm-hmm. Losses are part and parcel. You learn to embrace it. But it takes us so, so long to sort of understand that. Yeah. So uh, to get be, to be consistently profitable after you've got your front of house sorted, which is your risk of ruin, I think the big thing is trade really, really small right? So you don't care about the outcome of any individual trade. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and understand it, it's just part and parcel of trading. It's the business, it's the inventory you have to carry. You can't, you can't avoid it. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't, I don't know how, how to avoid it. <laughs> no, I mean, no, you're right. Being able to, <clears throat> being able to deal with losses. Yeah. That's, that's something you, that, that that's a must have. Um, if you want to be a trader, if, if, if you can't deal with losses, if they, if they screw you up, it's, it's just going to be, not, not a good not a good situation so yeah very good well i'll tell you what brian this, this has been enjoyable talking with you man thanks thanks for taking the time and sharing your thoughts and everything and your, and your story with us it was uh, excellent um and uh yeah again uh everybody you know uh that's that's listening uh you know if you like what brent shares and you're curious to find out more about you know his uh his approach and and how he might help you with your trading definitely swing by his, his site i'll make sure the link is you know in the show notes in the description down below and, uh, you know, also everybody for, you know, that's listening, I applaud you for taking time out of your day to, you know, learn more and develop yourself as a trader. Uh, that's, uh, that's always good instead of just chasing strategies to, to, you know, focus on yourself as a trader and becoming a better trader. So good, good job on, on taking the time out for that. Um, and yeah, well, we'll go, just go and wrap it up. Uh, Brent, thanks again for, for, uh, you know, uh, taking time out of your day and sharing your wisdom with us today. So, um, Uh, everybody. uh, We'll go and wrap things up and we'll see you on the next episode of the Consistent Profits Podcast. Thank you for joining us today on the Consistent Profits Podcast brought to you by Inside Out Trading. Make sure to swing by Inside Out Trading and pick up your copy of The Proven Formula for Consistent Monthly Profits. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to subscribe on your favorite channel and we'll see you on the next episode. Cheers.